Okay. <clears throat> well, we've still got a few people joining, but I think in the interest of time, we should go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, in the uh, as we go throughout, if you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A feature uh, down on the bar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll be addressing the Q&A towards the end of the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Jason Boley. I'm the Executive Vice President for Technology and Operations at BWF. And I'm pleased to have a wonderful panel of experts joining me today to discuss the 2024 due diligence survey findings, which the full results will be uh, released uh, in, the, in the upcoming few weeks. Uh, today's discussion will start with a brief overview of the survey's key takeaways, and then we'll move into a lively discussion, a conversation about the results. Um, we have also aimed to save some time at the end for audience questions. So again, using that Q&A feature down below. <clears throat> um, joining me today, as you see on screen, uh, we have Jason Briggs, who's the co-founder and director of Pyro Solutions, as well as a consulting partner for BWF Europe. We have Becca Daniel, who's an account executive at Zapian. She works across uh, customer success, sales, and marketing with a focus on the nonprofit and fundraising sector. Shannon Cooper, who is Director of Operations Consulting at BWF. And Catherine Flatten, who is an Associate Vice President at, of Prospect Development at BWF. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get into the preliminary part of the discussion um, where we talk about some key uh, findings from the survey. There you see some key metrics uh, from the survey up on the screen. We'll get started with our first question. Um, I'll turn it over to the group in just a moment to begin the discussion. Um, but to get started, uh, Becca, how would you define for our audience due diligence in the context of philanthropy? Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining, and thanks for BWF for hosting us as well. Um, it is hard to define, so I was slightly nervous about this question, but to put it simply, due diligence is what protects your organization from any risk. So obviously reputational risk, but also regulatory risk and financial risk as well when you're entering into relationships with third parties. Um, Obviously, it's hard to pin down because who defines what is risk and, you know, who defines what kind of diligence is due. Um, but I think Mike Foote at Dartmouth College puts it really well about wanting to go into fundraising with your eyes open. So really about understanding who your donor is, making sure their values align with your organization and making sure that by accepting a donation, you know, you know whether there might be any fallout for your organization. So it shouldn't be a barrier to fundraising. It is an opportunity to really know who your donor is. Um, and it can also be a good thing to demonstrate to all your donors and your stakeholders that you're really committed to ethical fundraising. It can be laborious work, as I'm sure many of the um, attendees of this call know. It can be a lot of manual work, checking databases, sanctions lists, Google, legal filings, etc. Um, and we do often see that it's sort of added on to the plate of prospect research teams who might be already sort of working at capacity. So I think we're going to dig into a little bit about tools, resources, what can sort of help um, to deal with this extra work. I'm not sure if anyone here was at the NEDRA session with Josh and Chris on the survey, but um, my director, Chris, made the point about how institutional policies are often a result of organizational scar tissue. So if something goes really wrong, everyone's stressed, and as a result, a policy is created to stop it happening again. You know, in the UK, we've really seen this with due diligence. So higher education was hit with controversy around the Gaddafi donations back in 2009. Um, and due diligence definitely was established in the UK, well, sort of at least further along established, a bit earlier. And in the US and more widely, we've since seen the fallout around the Sacklers, Epstein, etc. There's a sort of lot of um, scar tissue issue in the industry, which has made everyone a bit more cautious. I know Canada has been um, going through some of this stuff more recently as well. I saw Rena from Alberta's on the call. Um, we definitely do see, though, that it's the organizations who have had some reputation damage that, that are the ones that see the need to sort of spend money on it because they've seen firsthand how costly the damage is. So summarize, it's about going into a fundraising relationship with your eyes open to any risks that might come, balancing those risks and those benefits and making sure that everyone, you know, the stakeholders, fundraisers, comms team, managing directors, et cetera, all know what those risks might be and also know what your due diligence process is. So you have your messaging ready should something happen. That's great. Thank you, Becca. I think uh, that's really insightful. And it's also um, 
as I look at the the screen, you know, noticing the different, uh, just the, the great regional participation that we had in this survey, which is uh, reflected in the comments that you made. So thank you for that. Um, and so now that we've shared a little bit of understanding about what due diligence is, um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jason uh, for a brief overview of the most significant uh, findings from this year's survey. Jason? Great, thanks. Yep, so I'm just going to give an overview of the uh, key findings. Um, the survey goes into a lot of depth in, 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 in all these areas um, and some key takeaways, really, primarily to set the context for the panel discussion. But as you can see here, we launched this in February, 236 respondents, and uh, the focus was US, UK and Australia, and the lead sectors being education and medical environment. In the analysis, we also were splitting uh, the results by income size as well, so large, medium and small, and we represented about 10 billion in terms of revenue. So looking at the key takeaways, the seven we wanted to uh, highlight, and the first one is Despite, you know, due diligence being around for, for a while, you know, as mentioned in some countries more than others, uh, there were aspects of it that, that made due diligence still feel very much like an emerging field. And we had 84% of us with a formal due diligence process, but how those processes will behave and those outputs, you know, they could range uh, significantly. And this was kind of indicating in areas we're still grappling on the sector logic and how to deploy aspects of the policies uh, but also um, we're, we're kind of still reaching towards a consensus for best practice. Um, and we'll see some of that kind of range in these coming slides. And nonetheless, we have a key takeaway too. Um, financial thresholds are um, a leading structure of due diligence processes. Um, so we can see here 68% of us use financial thresholds. And this is where we're using various gift levels to activate different levels of due diligence response. So on the right there, you can see the UK and Australia are using thresholds um, more than the US um, at this moment in time. So in terms of setting the lowest threshold, the threshold activating the lowest due diligence process, this was generally set at about 25,000 or below. So this is essentially the gift level at which due diligence would start for many organisations. But we can see here there is quite a range. So some will be setting it as low as less than 5,000, all the way up to 250,000. And in the US, even as high um, as a million. Highest threshold, uh, so this threshold was activating the highest level of due diligence process, so seen as the donation size with the biggest amount of risk, let's say. Um, so again, you can see ranges existing, but there were clearer preferences than saying the lowest threshold. So in the US and Australia, these were gravitating towards setting this at a million, um, and the U UK was setting this um, a bit lower at um, 100,000. So key takeaway three, gift acceptance committees are taking a leading role in authorization. So just over half of us now deploy gift acceptance committees with various different makeups, and we will show that in the report. Uh, but what they're authorizing when it comes to the highest threshold uh, donations, um, they were certainly the lead authorizer at 38%. Uh, in terms of the lowest threshold, director was the lead authorizer, but committees were coming in second. Key takeaway four, sector confidence is generally low with teams feeling underfunded. Um, and this is quite interesting. So if you look at the bottom three, um, uh, results there, so ability to handle a public relations crisis, organisation taking due diligence seriously, confidence in due diligence process. Generally, we could say just over half or about half of us were feeling confident in these areas and, and half of us were not feeling particularly confident in these areas. And I guess for things like taking whether your organisation takes due diligence seriously, we'd, we'd want to really see a higher percentage of organisations saying uh, that they feel there are, their due diligence is taken seriously or very seriously or above. Uh, but that wasn't uh, majorly the case. You can see here the UK felt the most confident with the US feeling uh, the least confident in these areas. But at the top there, you can see due diligence and how well funded we're feeling. Um, and pretty much, you know, we're not feeling well funded at all in this area. Just taking Australia as an example in the green there, 10% felt that their due diligence resource was well funded or above. So key takeaway five, standard report volumes, times and content are being established. So the top left, we can see the report volumes. Um, essentially, 77% of us are completing between one to 50 reports per year. Um, and just below there, we've got the report times taken on average. So most of us, 47% are saying that our reports take around two to four hours, uh, with five to eight hours coming in second. Um, I guess 
when it says one hour or less or nine or more hours, these could be seen as outliers. And maybe in these areas, we're spending too little time or too much time. Uh, but that's something to be um, uh, to be looked at. So on the right there, we can see report content. And we were quite unanimous about this across countries, really. We all focused on the same three things, financial crimes, negative news, misalignment of values, um, and focusing less on areas like donor vulnerability. So key takeaway six, last couple. So budget levels varied, but the majority of us are spending on specialised due diligence resource. So looking at the left there, you can see the range of budgets uh, that were being reported. So this is the kind of overall prospect development budget, research budget, you could say. Um, so this would range from 1,000 up to 50,000, uh, most common being 10 to 25. Uh, yet still 10% of us are still reporting that we do not have um, a research budget. On the right is the percentage share that we said we would we spend on specialised due diligence resource. Um, and so we can see that the majority of us are spending um, on a specialised due diligence resource with the majority spending between 1% to 25% of their budget. Um, yet still 32% of us are not spending any budget on due diligence resource um, at all. So last section, uh, key takeaway seven, respondents believe AI will bring increased efficiency. One third have considered the use of AI significantly. So, um, so yeah, one third of us have considered um, uh, AI a good deal or greater. I think this slide was important because it shows really that there's more exploring for us to do when it comes to AI as a sector. And um, actually, when you look at the report, it shows that the more time people spent considering AI, the more convinced they became of it. Um, so this is encouraging us really to um, explore AI technologies that are available uh, more thoroughly. So in terms of impact, looking at the graph there, it was pretty conclusive. We do believe it will bring increased efficiency uh, with a small percent of us thinking AI will have no impact to due diligence um, and a small percent of us feeling it will fundamentally change um, our work. So that is a very top level overview um, of the key data points coming out of the survey. There's plenty more in the survey, many more questions. We break it down by country so we can benchmark. Um, and we also do some trend analysis, looking at trends across income sizes for organizations and countries too. So well worth getting uh, once the report becomes available. So Jason, over to you. Thank you, Jason. Um... That was a, a, a very insightful, and again, those are some of the key outcomes of the of the survey. Uh, we know that was a very quick run through, so to one of the questions that was asked, this will be recorded, it will be released after, we'll have some more information on that, so you can go back and dig into that a little bit further, as well as the release of the full survey results, which are pending soon. But uh, for now, let's get into the panel discussion to talk a little bit more in depth about some of these issues. Um, uh, again, thanks, Jason, for that insight. Uh, so let's start with some of our regional differences, and I'm going to put this uh, question over to Catherine. Uh, what were the most striking differences in due diligence practices uh, between the regions that were surveyed? Yeah, definitely we saw some differences for sure, and as, as Jason Brake mentioned, more detail on that in the report. Um, I was really interested and a little alarmed to see that the U.S. respondents were the only ones who indicated um, that million mark as the lowest gift level that triggers their due diligence process. And not only were the U.S. the only ones, but a whopping 26% of U.S. respondents actually selected that as their lowest trigger threshold. So it seems like some, many U.S. organizations um, have a belief that gifts below that level don't pose significant enough risk um, to warrant incorporation into their due diligence programs, which I personally see as a huge gap, right? That's, that's a lot of potential exposure that we're not accounting for. Um, and it might be a fair assessment that high dollar gifts inherently do carry greater risks, but lower dollar gifts, especially if they include naming rights, are certainly not exempt from that. So our, our colleagues in the UK and Australia seem to be a little bit more aware of that potential for exposure of, of those lower gifts than we are here in the US. Um, but on the other hand, another regional difference that I noticed is that the US is really leading the way with gift acceptance committees, which is wonderful to see for us. Um, these committees, I think, are just so beneficial to the dil due diligence process for a few reasons. Um, one is that they temper the potential influence that any one person in your development organization um, may have over the gift decision. Um, gift acceptance committees also help ensure that all key perspectives are represented because they can pull from different areas of development and, and bring some balanced conversation. 
Um, and another uh, benefit, I guess, of, of the gift acceptance committees is that it lessens the risk of any one person being held personally responsible for a gift acceptance gone wrong, which could be up to and including losing their job over it. So it kind of spreads, spreads the love there um, and, and helps kind of temper those kinds of outcomes. And then the last key difference that I really noticed is around confidence. Even though there were trends in, in that confidence slide that Jason showed, in nearly all of the questions about confidence, the U.S. ranked the lowest with Australia in the middle and the U.K. ranking uh, the, with the highest confidence. And I think that this probably reflects more the, the um, relative longevity and sophistication of due diligence as a formal function or program in each of our countries. Um, so I think that with more experience, more training and more resources, including the use of gift acceptance committees, confidence is likely to grow. And one interesting note here, too, is that all three countries rank their confidence in their due diligence program funding as low, as Jason mentioned, right? 10 percent of Australian respondents, 14 percent of U.S. and 18 percent of U.K. respondents were, were the levels that reported strong confidence in that area. So that's really low. And program funding is obviously a big concern across the board. So certainly some regional differences, but some regional commonalities as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, next question is going to go to Shana. Um, so Shana, when conducting uh, due diligence, how did the nonprofits in different countries prioritize different types of risks? So as Jason mentioned, there's actually a lot of similarity here. Um, the respondents from all three countries share the same top three risks, pending uh, legal allegations, financial crimes, and negative news. And then just under those top three, for all of them was misalignment of values, um, which made it into the cumulative top three. We see it as a really strong, positive trend that value and reputational risk are aligned with financial and legal risk in prominence. Um, additionally, I was really pleased to see that donor vulnerability is considered a risk by at least half of the respondents in the UK and Australia, and almost half in the US. Um, our colleague here at BWF, Lainey McCuller, has been working with others for several years around the um, special needs of managing uh, donors with dementia. And based on their research, this growing population of donors is a real and present risk in for all organizations. Um, and so uh, we're very hopeful that more um, organizations um, will uh, consider this as uh, they continue their programs. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Um, this next question is for Catherine. I, I love this question because I've been a part of some lively discussions about it. And you spend your day, your day is mostly focusing and working with clients that uh, in the prospect development field. I know we have a lot of, a lot of people on the call um, representing the prospect development area and APRA contingent. Um, so would you say um, that due diligence is primarily viewed as a function of prospect research? Yeah, I think historically that's really true because prospect development performs the research that underpins the process. We're often seen as sort of the owners of, of that program or function. Um, I do think there's a little bit of a danger in that approach, though, because it potentially puts too much responsibility on just prospect development, especially when it comes to actually evaluating the risk that is surfaced through the, through the research process. It's really, really critical that risk is defined at the board level, including what levels of risk are or are not acceptable to the organization. And then ideally the fundraising leadership will work with prospect development as well as the gift acceptance committee where hopefully prospect development is represented anyway. Um, and together then they will create that framework for categorizing and um, evaluating the risks that are found in the course of that research, as well as determine who the decision makers will be for various gift levels and risk types, because it may not make sense to have the same decision makers um, for, for every gift conversation that is subject to due diligence. So this team approach we think is really critical to make sure that there's a very robust process and that um, prospect development isn't, isn't sort of overly burdened with making decisions that would be better to have a broader conversation. 
Um, I think something else to consider here too is when exactly due diligence occurs within the course of prospect research and again, at what level. While it would certainly be ideal to have a full due diligence profile on every constituent in your database before you even reach out to them for this first time, um, that's really not possible for most organizations, at least currently. So that said though, waiting until the gift conversation is about to occur or has already occurred um, really carries its own risks, right? In the, in the form of time wasted on cultivating a gift that can't ultimately be accepted. Um, and not to mention the likely negative effects that that would have on the organization's relationship with the prospective donor should they have to roll back a gift conversation, right? So there's some danger there too. We really have to make sure that um, as prospect development, we're helping our organization balance the potential risk against the resources that are required to ex execute due diligence and, and scale it appropriately. Um, we can certainly make recommendations from prospect research on this side, but again, really needing that consensus of the broader team to establish a final framework. And speaking of resources, I also just want to mention the importance of sufficient time, tools, and training for due diligence programs. I think you know some organizations are, are really excited to start this work and they think that they can just like boot it up and go, uh, but really starting up or, or even building out an existing due diligence program doesn't just happen magically as many of us know, right? It takes real work um, to, to do it correctly. And I see a lot of organizations tend to sort of underestimate what prospect development in particular will need to fulfill its responsibilities when they are establishing their due diligence policies and procedures. So if um, an organization's in-house prospect development staff are already at capacity and the organization is not willing or able to hire additional FPEs to take on that research lift, organizations might want to consider hiring some outside help because otherwise there's a real risk, not only of burning out your prospect development staff, but also of just accidental oversight that might occur when your staff are trying to just move too quickly through too much work. Um, personally, I'm really excited by some of the AI products that we're seeing come to market, like our, our friends at Zapian, that I think have really tremendous potential to help researchers produce high quality due diligence deliverables at scale without spending hours, if not days, performing some, some really tedious and manual work. That's great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, the next topic uh, I love, as we saw earlier in the survey results, um, most organizations feel underfunded in the area of due diligence and risk prevention. Um, and uh, due diligence is an area where we're talking about preventing risks. So um, the ROI on that is really hard to quantify. So Shannon, um, how can organizations justify the investment in these preventative measures despite the challenges um, in demonstrating their immediate value? So this really is a very interesting question because clearly the survey shows that due diligence programs are undervalued and underfunded. Um, and as Becca said earlier, um, you know, my experience is that it's either when they get that scar tissue or when you start talking to the board or the legal counsel or risk managers in the organization that they begin to fully acknowledge the full scope of philanthropic risk, um, which is unfortunate. Um, that said, the survey also shows some really interesting insights into a few strategies that uh, make a difference within development. So as Catherine was talking about, due diligence has traditionally been considered um, a subset of prospect development, though it can be argued that it's an entirely different function. Um, and so taking steps to delineate the difference between prospect development and due diligence may help um, to uplift the funding directed to it. Um, a first step towards this is having a separate budget line item for due diligence. Um, respondents um, to the survey, a full 78% of them indicated that they did not have a separate due diligence line item. Um, but interestingly, the respondents that did were more likely to feel that their program was taken more seriously um, by their leadership. Um, so getting a separate line item is a first step. Um, but then how would you spend that um, budget? Because obviously 
uh, you want to start off fairly small in a way that leadership will accept. So training is an important element that we've been discussing, and it can be scaled and delivered, not just to prospect research, but to all areas of the department. Um, as I've discussed, the issue of managing vulnerable donors is a big one, and research validates that the need for fundraiser training in this area. Uh, crisis communications is another area where training makes a difference. Then there's the opportunity to demonstrate improved ROI by leveraging some of the software we've been dis discussing that's um, specialized, um, offered by organizations like uh, Zapian and Pyro Solutions, um, which spe specifically relate to due diligence. It makes the research a lot faster and you can get things um, identified uh, more efficiently. So for those organizations that don't have the funding because those are expensive software packages, um, turning to organizations like BWF who can provide the research with access to tools like that as a way to start your program and demonstrate that ROI is um, feasible um, and ensure leadership that the bus budget doesn't have to be large to have a significant impact on due diligence. Due diligence. Yeah, and Becca, would you say there's any growing consensus on establishing uh, standard models for due diligence? Yeah, it is hard to get industry standard models, and I don't think there'll be sort of a, you know, there'll ever be a one size fits all in terms of the due diligence process. It does depend on the institution's values, their risk tolerance, even often what the sort of specific gift is going towards, whether that's a particular school or whatever within the university. So a mining organization, as an example, might be an unsuitable prospect for a green development campaign, but it might work for an engineering school or a business school, etc. There definitely is, as I think as Catherine mentioned, you know, a growing best practice to do more comprehensive of due diligence earlier on in the process, not when there's a gift on the table. There's an example I heard of with one of our clients recently that they had to turn away a hundred well a $1 million gift or a $100 million gift rather at the very last minute. And you can imagine how sort of painful and frustrating that is for everyone involved, as well as sort of awkward with the donor and potentially their network as well. The earlier you go into a process knowledgeable about any risks, the more you can do to mitigate it because you know either you can sort of not waste any fundraiser or researcher time, or the fundraiser can ask a lot of questions during the process that will actually help to sort of give the full context on that risk. Obviously, it's hard to do because of time, and I, I know it's a lot to do with capacity, but tools definitely can help here. It is also, as Catherine was discussing, it's really important that due diligence research is coupled with coupled with institutional policies that are coming from the top down. So whether that's, um, you know, a due diligence policy across different departments within a nonprofit or a university, for example, for research funding, for donors, for suppliers, for partners, etc. The risk with this sometimes is that while everyone's trying to sort of establish a best practice, that slows things down, all the conversations they're having. And so it's sort of you're unprotected in the meantime with some of your donations. Um, so it is worth having something, but having those conversations with other departments as well. And with yeah, legal counsel, with a compliance department, if your institution has that, sort of making sure everyone's on board. Um, thresholds are definitely a part of having policies. You know, I totally appreciate with the conversation in the chat, they are just you know necessary from a capacity perspective, but there is an element to which they're arbitrary. You know, would the media necessarily distinguish between a 40K gift that was controversial and a 100K gift or a million gift? Not necessarily so. Um, so it is a balancing act, but I think the growing standard, you know, in different jurisdictions is towards lower thresholds. So some of our UK clients are lowering their threshold from 50K to 25K, even 10K, and some US clients, maybe 5 million to a million or 1 million to sort of 500K, et cetera. Um, and definitely tooling, again, or resources is helpful here. And finally, I'll just touch on sort of gift committees and ethics committees as, yeah, the survey shows the US is sort of ahead in terms of their use of this. I do think it's really, really valuable and it's really helpful to have sort of decision making power away from the prospect research teams themselves. Um, but it does need to be done carefully. So I hear a lot of stories from clients about someone getting held up in a committee and that committee might only meet three times a year and they might sort of discuss it a little bit and say, actually, we need more information. Let's meet again about it in sort of four months time. So 
use them wisely for the sort of most nuanced and complicated of cases. Most of them should be able to be quite straightforward to a director of development, etc., um, and use those gift committees for the more kind of nuanced, quite subjective cases, which needs a lot of discussion, um, and also make sure that they're presented with all the data they need, so you're not going back and forth between the research teams and the committees as well. Great. Thank you both. Um, next question is for Jason Briggs. Um, just speaking generally, um, how have you seen uh, te technological advances impact the due diligence process? I think um, overall it's been, we've seen a relatively straightforward impact in that it's increased speed and depth of analysis. Um, and I think we've seen that, um, you know, in, advancing in really positive ways recently. And, you know, a good example of that is straightforward negative news searches, you know, on individuals in particular, has been a really useful advancement. You know, it highlights negative words, uh, keywords, aggregates articles, legal cases, different languages. Um, so you don't have to go through every single publication to be confident, you know, that you've got an overview on someone. Um, and I think that's a huge selling point. And, and Zabian has been leading the way on that with um, language programming as well. Um, and the stuff that we've been doing at Power Solutions, uh, the resource Codify, it, it focuses on wealth, um, but people have been using it in the context of due diligence, and they're giving a bit more of an appraisal now on their reports in terms of financial affordability, the liquidity of wealth, um, which I guess we, we'll come back to in terms of report content later. So, yeah, we've seen that kind of uh, deeper analysis um, enter the field on due diligence. Um, so, yeah, overall, speed uh, and depth, I think, is what has been the impact. Um and I guess overall, it's given people confidence as well when they have these tools. Great, thanks, Jason. So the next question, um, I'm keeping an eye on the Q and A section as well. So we might be able to to roll a couple into one, but is about AI, hot topic. Um, the chat topic is 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 recognizing the AI is not a perfect tool. There's some some ethical and sensitivity, privacy concerns around that. But um, just in general, Becca, wondering if you could address how AI is being utilized in due diligence within philanthropic organizations. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, just for context or for the benefit of anyone who doesn't know what Zapien is, we're sort of an automated due diligence and research platform. So we do use AI. And I totally agree with Jason. I think the biggest benefit of AI tools in general, as a lot of us have been finding out over the last few months, is time saving. So it can, you know, read a huge amount of data and summarize it. So you can then use that in a helpful way. This, this basically means that due diligence can be done without being such a burden on researcher time. So it can be done on more donors. So yeah, maybe lowering those thresholds, but it can also be done earlier in the process. It's sort of what we like to call kind of initial due diligence or IDD check maybe earlier on in the process. This does mean that, you know, no time is wasted and also prevents the awkwardness at the gift stage. Um, I think, you know, in terms of concern with AI tools, large language models like GPT-4, Gemini, et cetera, can read and summarize a lot of information. But I think that, you know, if people do like to experiment with them, I think they're better at the sort of identification stage and helping you build lists, summarize information, et cetera, just because they're not designed for due diligence. So they don't use more structured data like corporate filing, sanctions, watches, et cetera. And they're not designed to separate between one individual with the same name and another. So you could ask something, you know, are there controversies with Chris Smith of Nestle, but they might combine a few different different Chris Smithers into there. So you do want to be careful with using those large language models. We do integrate some of this generative AI tools in our um, platform to create helpful summaries and present data in a helpful way. But we combine open source media with more structured data sets like corporate filings, legal proceedings, and um, sanctions and watch list databases as well, which means you're getting quite a full picture. Um, it is interesting and the key takeaways about AI impact, you know, the majority did believe that AI brings about increased efficiency, but only quite a small percentage think it will fundamentally change work or processes. And, you know, despite coming from an AI company, I do partly agree with this. I think there isn't a world where you just use an AI tool to do all your due diligence and it sort of gives someone a score and says, actually, you can take a donation from them or you can't, because it's really a human subjective, you know, nuanced discussion a lot of the time. Even in the UK under GDPR laws, you can't use automated tools to make a decision that will affect someone's life. And the US has something similar with the Fair Credit Reporting Act as well. Um, but you can use it to sort of aggregate all the data and then do the sort of more um, strategic tasks of assessing, making decisions, et cetera. So you can use it to do the grunt work for you, but make sure that you are still doing the assessing, the judgment makings, et cetera. Um, 
And just to touch on the question in the Q&A box in terms of sort of data privacy and worry about giving AI tools um, information that they might not necessarily have anyway, I do think that's a big concern with those sort of um, large language models like ChatGPT4. Um, with Zapien, you don't really give us information. You would just give us someone's name and, an, and their organization or their sort of LinkedIn profile, and then you'd sort of get the data that's open source. So you're not giving AI basically any data that they wouldn't have anyway, which I think sort of mitigates a lot of that. Um, I do think though, and I, I will stop here, but I do think that AI can revolutionize processes if you don't just sort of necessarily add it into your current process, but you think about how a tool can actually change your processes. So that might be some of the things we've been talking about, like lowering thresholds, doing due diligence earlier on. Um, it can really change your processes and change the way that you're doing things, but it's not easy to get everyone on board with change processes, particularly in institutions like universities that have, might have had these processes in place for a really long time. So I think either work with a really trusted technology provider that's going to help you with that or use people like some of the experts on this call that can help you and know the technology themselves and can help you in terms of how to integrate it into your workflows. Great. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, we're uh, drawing up on our last couple of uh, questions here for the uh, panelist portion of the webinar. Um, and as part of that, I'm going to ask Jason to uh, break out his crystal ball. Um, so based on this year's survey results, uh, what future trends uh, do you anticipate in the field of philanthropic due diligence? Yeah, just um, just a handful, really. And um, I think financial thresholds will become, you know, an established part of all uh, due diligence processes. Um, and I think that's very much about it's not just controlling uh, the amount of research you do, but it's about also appropriating the senior staff time um, and where their attention um, should go. So I think that's going to become uh, really well established. And I think we're going to actually, I think we need more big conversations in the sector collectively about how these are set. Um, but I think we're going to gravitate towards them being set proportionate to income. And I haven't decided, you know, uh, based on what Becca's comments have been, I kind of feel like lowest thresholds could go up rather than down um but actually if you do have technology to do a cursory check at a lower level why wouldn't you um so i'm kind of uh, a bit divided by that but but i do think um qualitative analysis uh, will enter reports more um and shannon touched on this um and essentially around i think more is going to be done a conflict of interest but things like donor well-being and vulnerability and financial affordability. And I think essentially what we'd be doing here is checking, um, are we too having undue influence on an individual? Um, and I think that's um, an important conversation. If you're a reputable organization, big brand name, maybe there is pressure to donate in certain contexts that, that we're kind of unaware of. And just kind of reflecting on those might become a, an important part of reports one way or another. Final couple of things, committees will grow. And I think we'll see two levels of committees, one for lower gifts, one for higher. And lastly, it does feel like, you know, maybe due diligence teams are going to gradually become separate from prospect development and becoming more and more specialised profession. Um, and I do think more of the function media relations skill sets, so proactive reputation management, um, and Becca touched on this as well, having pre-built uh, communications um, in terms of how we respond to crises. Um, and just a final comment really on that. I think when I've been looking at various, if you like, gift scandals that have come out in the news and I've kind of asked myself the question, well, who's doing better in all this? You know, why is one person getting more reputational damage and one isn't? And I think those that are able to, sh to show um, and have a set statement and, and to show that they follow the process, even if the gift goes wrong, they seem to fare much better um in uh, when it comes to reputational crisis so i think we're going to see much more proactive reputation management uh, within due diligence teams so that was a, a general sense of what might come that's great jason i really appreciate that comment and it's one of the great things that i enjoy about talking about due diligence is it just crosses so many different areas of the organization so many uh, communications and prospect development and and uh so um, lots of important takeaways there. Um, last question, uh, Catherine, um, with the expanding uh, global scope of the survey, uh, what practical lessons can nonprofits take away to enhance their due diligence framework? Yeah, um, my first and, and primary lesson is that philanthropic 
risk mitigation really starts with the board. And development staff should not take this on without direct input from their organization's leadership. I think that's that's first and foremost for me. Um, the second takeaway for me is that due diligence, one, is a team sport, and two, requires dedicated resources, which is not probably a, a surprise to anyone here. Um, so just make sure that your organization's key staff are represented throughout the process in balance. Leverage those gift acceptance committees, or if you don't have them, start thinking about how to stand those up. And make sure that your organization is providing training, not just for your prospect researchers, but really for the entire development team to provide that foundational understanding of risks, of warning signs that they might be able to see, and then also of their institutional procedures and resources. Um, third takeaway is to balance the risk and the investment. There is no one size fits all approach as we've discussed. Organizations do need to set their own triggers that are likely to um, catch as much of the potential risk as possible, while also ensuring that appropriate resources are both available and sustainable over the long term. So the direction for each organization's approach to striking the right balance should again start with the board. Um, the resources that, that are needed should be informed by the prospect of development team. So telling everyone you know, what it's going to take to get this done as envisioned. And then that ultimate framework should be determined collaboratively by the development leadership and the gift acceptance committee, which may include your legal counsel. There was a question earlier in the Q&A, really good, thoughtful question about where does legal counsel, in-house legal counsel factor into all of this. So potentially on the gift acceptance committee could be one spot, um, but certainly in the development of those policies and procedures, really important to have that voice and perspective represented. And the last key takeaway for me is that I just want folks to know that they don't have to do this alone, right? We have a really great community. Um, everyone on this webinar, on this panel has really deep expertise in due diligence too. And we are here to help, right? We can help organizations set up and execute programs that are gonna protect their institutions effectively without being a huge drain on their resources. Thank you, Catherine. Um... Thank you, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we do have a few questions in the Q&A, which we want to get to. But before we open it up to that, uh, I'd ask any of the panelists, any closing thoughts you want to add quickly? Well, I think one of the things that I'd like to say is that we just still have a lot of an, an unanswered questions. And we pose a lot of those questions actually as part of uh, the survey. And so I think it will be interesting um, for all of you and all of you will have the oppor opportunity to access the survey um, to see just uh, how far we've come, but how far we've uh, yet to go um, to mature this um, field um, within development and across our organizations. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the, yeah, I think Jason's point about the institutions that often do better when there is some sort of scandal crisis are the ones that can back up their decisions and say, well, actually, we didn't know about this, but we went ahead for this reason. So I'd say a really, really key takeaway would be to sort of have an audit trail of all the research you're doing. If you are doing your due diligence research manually, make sure that you're storing, you know, storing that somewhere that's still going to be there in 10 years time. If you're using a tool, an automated tool, download it as a PDF. So even if you're not using that tool anymore, you've got that audit trail. Something, yeah, something that might not be a risk now might happen in five or six years, or, you know, our definitions of risk might change geopolitically or sort of culturally. But if you can back up why you made that decision, then you, you know, you you can sort of be feel quite safe and comfortable, I think. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so we have quite a few questions in the Q and A. Um, we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can, and uh, in the interest of time, if we can't, we'll, we'll follow up with individuals after the webinar. Um, but starting off uh, for the group, um, do you have any advice? And this kind of harkens back to the ROI question, I think, a little bit. Uh, but leadership. Um, when it, leadership at every level of the organization um, says due diligence isn't important because we know our donors. I would say you know what your donors have told you, and you may know what prospect research has uncovered from an opportunity standpoint in terms of financial capacity and assets, external giving, right, those kinds of things. That is not the same as knowing your donors from a due diligence perspective. There are things that that can sort of hide behind the surface. And if the donor doesn't want you to necessarily know, they may not be upfront about it. 
And also things can develop over time, right? Where your donor was and who they were a couple of years ago when you started engaging with them, there may have been things that have happened since then that you may not be aware of. So I understand the impulse to say uh, that, that they know that they're donors and that's not untrue, but they may not know the full picture. And that's really what due diligence is for. If you could find a case study, particularly within your own database, right, or an example of a time when something came up that the organization was not aware of, that might help in illustrating your point as well. I think that really covers mm -hmm. it. Just to add, we do I do come across this a lot, or some institutions say, oh, you know, we really want to do due diligence on almost everyone, but the institution says we only need to do it on international ones because the domestic ones we know. And it, it doesn't mean that, you know, there's no reputational risks if they're domestic. Um, I think Catherine's point about finding a case study is really, really helpful. And it is sort of a matter of putting together a business case of saying, actually, if we do this as part of our research, this is what it's cost other organizations. There's some really good stats out there about what reputational damage can cost an organization, particularly when it is a not-for-profit or a university where reputation is so important it can lead to less donations so it's not you know it's not about getting less money or spending money on something that you're not going to see money back it really is um yeah it really can be costly um to not do this work i'd like to give a quick case study so i'm from oklahoma um and uh the statewide chair of a children's hospital campaign um with came out and they had done research on them and they're top philanthropists. Uh, what they didn't do was due diligence research. And it turns out they're also one of the top cannabis growers in Oklahoma. So it didn't look good in terms of uh, children's health. So there's, there's research and then there's due diligence research. And those are two different things. Just to just to finally add on that, I think Becky, you mentioned it right at the beginning. Um, if you're trying to encourage leadership to get involved, you know, I think the case studies and the business case, like mentioned, but there are real examples where leadership has lost their jobs because they didn't have a process. They weren't taking that professional responsibility with their organization's reputation, infrastructure. So ultimately, you can highlight that to them. And if they're comfortable with that, you know, um, then that's kind of on them, isn't it? So um so yeah, I think there's a multiple avenues you can take. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is a little bit more logistical, but maybe we'll expand it just a little bit. But we talked in the survey results about thresh dollar thresholds in terms of of uh, instigating due diligence processes. But uh, this question is about due diligence based on gift types. So uh, crypto is an example, or bequests. Um, and asking if that was part of the survey logistically, but also I would ask if you have any thoughts on that um, in general. It wasn't part of the survey. We had so many questions. It's such a complex process to analyze across organizations. Choosing the right ones was, was quite difficult. So we didn't actually have a question on um, gift type, although that is an interesting one we can take note of uh, for next time. Um, yeah. I don't particularly have any thoughts on different types of due diligence for the types of gift, but, you know, now it's raised, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, some considerations there, but other panel members will be able to comment on their thoughts. I think it raises, oh, sorry, Shannon, you go ahead. One of the things that we do uh, when we work with boards on developing due diligence policies is walk through with them the different types of donations the organization accepts because there's not only different levels of risk with different types of donations, but there's also different levels of um, uh, tolerance that boards have based upon the different types of donations. And so those are important considerations for each organization. Thanks, Becca, go on. I was just going to add really that I think it brings up the good point that even if you've got policies and you've got thresholds and you've got guidance, there's always going to be things that, you know, you have to judge on a case by case basis. A gift might be looking like it's coming from a foundation or an individual and then at the last minute they're giving through their corporate and you think, oh, actually, now we need to vet that. Or there might be something that just feels a bit off and you can't really pin something down. Or you might feel actually maybe we should check this a little bit more because it is a crypto vehicle. Um, I think yeah, we're never going to be able to iron out all of those 
you know, specific niche situations in a policy, but definitely do, you know, don't ignore gut feel when it comes to these things as well. Thank you. Um, we'll move along to the next question. Um, this one's uh, related to uh, reporting and, and metrics in general that you might have recommendations on for leaders beyond just activities in terms of like how many due diligence checks we did. Um, they use as an example, tracking how many um, gifts we accepted or declined based on the activity, but any other kind of unique um, tracking or, or um, uh, KPI uh, that you would recommend um, as part of your due diligence activities? Um, accepted and rejected levels of gifts, I think, uh, would be one, uh, especially the, the senior levels of panels, uh, amount of reports done. Um, but I think, Catherine, you had some thoughts on this, didn't you, from the conversations that we had? Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say that I see sort of consistencies in how teams report out on this, but some ideas that I've been kicking around with some folks are things like um, counting the number of red flags that you identified out of the reports that you did over a period of time and then relate those back to the gift value or the prospect capacity if the gift if the conversation hasn't reached a, a point of gift yet um to say you know we identified it i identified and mitigated x dollars worth of risk you could also create some sort of um like x days without incident kind of safety ticker for each day that your organization does not have any negative philanthropic related press it's a little bit of a stretch, but you know, if we are talking about those ultimate effects of what due diligence is preventing, that's the, that's one of the major outcomes, right? Is is avoiding those kinds of things. So, just a couple of thoughts, but I think some more creativity and conversation around how to present this in terms of the value that it brings would be very, very welcome. Thank you. I'm going to try to keep us moving so we can squeeze in as many questions as possible. The next question. Uh, what is the right time to conduct a due diligence review, in your opinion? Before the yeah. constituent enters your database. No, I'm just <laughs> Go ahead, Becca. I think, you know, and I am talking from an ideal perspective here, it would be after the identification stage. So you think, okay, we found a good, you know, if it's for a particular um, campaign or particular project, you found your list of people that you've already identified that have capacity. And then as part of the research, you know, when you'd be finding a bit more about their career history, their network, um, who they are as a person, it can be really helpful to do at least an initial screen there. And I think lots of teams do, even if they don't, if it's not part of their policy. You know, if you find something when you're going across their sort of your normal prospect research, you will sort of flag it or you will do a little bit more research into that. So I think, yeah, in an ideal world, it would be after the identification stage and sort of either at the start of a conversation process or at least, you know, as soon as a conversation is developing, much before the actual gift is on the table. Yeah, we, we would do that mainly just that we would do a basic scan when a prospect was assigned, um, if their gift capacity was over a certain level based upon resource. Um, the survey, which we didn't show it on, in the um, in the overview, the survey showed the most respondents did their due diligence just before an ask was made, uh, which was interesting. And then the second one down where they had a typical time was at the point of prospect um, identification. So the, that initial research uh, phase with new technologies we, we might well see that change um so yeah i don't know whether shannon you've got a thought on an ideal time to yeah I, I i was just going to say that right now it's uh unaffordable for most to try to do all but we're getting more and more requests from clients to do uh, due diligence screenings in the same way that we do well screenings on the entire database. Um, and, and obviously these are high level initial ones, but it's becoming more and more possible and more and more affordable as uh, the technology um, becomes more accessible um, and able to provide for that. So I think that's what we're gonna see in the near future. Great. We've got time for one more question. There are a couple of logistical questions in here that would be, I think, good to follow up on email. But the last one we'll take is from uh, Jessica, who's asking if, um, if she, out of curiosity with the, the uh, clients that you work with, if uh, prospect development shops, if you see them making um, actual risk assessment as part of the due diligence process, meaning that you have a 
in her case, she says she has a binary like concerns found or no concerns found conclusion. But, um, you know, do you see that kind of definitive recommendation coming out of it uh, before turning that over to leadership or the gift acceptance committees? So what I recommend is that the leadership and gift acceptance committee and prospect development together define that framework and give, you know, sort of examples or describe what risk looks like for your various categories and what low risk looks like versus high risk, right? So that you all sort of agree on that risk assessment framework. And then as prospect development is doing the research, you sort of summarize your findings into that framework, but then the gift acceptance committee and leadership take that and discuss it and, and you know, take it forward with how they're going to actually make the decision. So you're not making the decision and you're not even really defining the risk, but you're taking what you are finding through the course of your research and inserting it into that framework so that, you know, they're not having to, to sort of go through the entire report and pull that out for themselves. And I think that's a nice compromise point. We would do red, amber, green, uh, like traffic light. Um, and that was mainly if, if, if there's many gifts in a committee. They can have a they can have a quick executive view of of the overall results and then deeper conversations if if they were required. Um, so it wasn't binary like that, no, and it was definitely informed, like Catherine said, with leadership's input. There was a recent incident at one of the major universities in um, the United States where um, the gift processors were able to um, alert leadership of issues found. And so it's not just prospect research, it's, it's across the organization and these flags need to be raised. And um, I think that it's one of the mechanisms that will continue to um, help development departments understand the importance of advancement services and um, what they bring to the fundraising process. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, that's all we have time for today. Really great content shared, great discussion. So really appreciate everybody logging in. Um, and thanks for joining BWF to talk about due diligence today. Um, and hope you're looking forward to the full um, report results. So please stay tuned for an email with a copy of today's recording. And feel free to reach out to, to myself uh, via email or LinkedIn or um, if you want to know more, we'll be following up with some information and you see some QR codes there on the screen, which will give a second for people to uh, um, take a shot of um, if you want to find out more information for when the full survey results are released. So we will see you next time. And thanks again for joining today.